How you doing? I'm Craig Wright, I'm an orthopedic uh, trauma surgeon. Basically what that means is that I treat a lot of fractures, uh, I take a lot of ER calls, so that's mainly what I do. Um, so we're going to talk about fractures of the shoulder, which is kind of an ambitious topic to talk about in, in 20 minutes, so I'm going to kind of narrow it down uh, and try not to repeat a lot of what's been said already. Um, just a general point about treating fractures in general, um, any fractures anywhere, uh, these aren't injuries people plan for. So. You know, a person with an arthritic knee or arthritic shoulder who can kind of prepare for if they need surgery, um, these, these injuries are acute and they happen and they can really change people's lives you know, in the near and, and long-term future. So um, treating these patients is, is different than treating a patient with a chronic condition because, you know, the, the, the construction worker who breaks his arm, um, it really affects his life. So uh, they're, they're much more, you know, they're not as patient, they're, they're much more eager to get back to work and things like that. So it's definitely different dealing with patients like this. Um, the goal is I'm going to review the anatomy quickly again. Um, I'm going to review presentation, examination, uh, and I'm going to try to narrow it down to just clavicle and proximal humerus fractures. Uh, the shoulder, again, is, is a, you know, a lot of structures going on, a lot of traumatic injuries that can happen. Uh, the clavicle and proximal humerus fractures are really the ones that we treat the most as surgeons, and you'll see the most in your primary care offices uh, by far. Again, overview, uh, I'm not going to beat this home again, but, you know, a lot of, so the, the main point of this is that a lot of the stabilizing forces, ligaments, muscles that we talked about for stabilizing the shoulder, now with fractures act as deforming forces. So the, the muscles and tendons now pull, separate the bones and can de deform fractures that can lead to different treatment options uh, because of the deforming forces on the fractures. Uh, the scapula, just a quick point about that, scapular fractures you're typically going to see in high energy injuries, so it's not going to see, not, usually not the ones you're going to see in your office. Um, usually we're treating these as yeah, car accidents, falls from height. Um, the scapula is very, very rarely operated on. Uh, there's few true indications for scapular uh, treatment of open uh, scapular fractures with surgery. Uh, and the main point behind that is that there's a robust muscular muscle around the scapula. So the scapula goal is really to an anchor for muscles. It acts as an anchor for these muscles to attach and to serve their function elsewhere. So the scapula just needs to heal, essentially. It doesn't have to heal perfectly, uh, so very rarely do you operate on scapular fractures, unless they involve the joint itself, which I'm not going kind to of really get into in this talk. Um, ligaments again. Again, these ligaments that were used now to stabilize the shoulder previously with fractures can deform fractures and can lead to you know, different deforming forces that require us to fix them because of the forces can't be counteracted by the bone being intact. So the radiographic anatomy, um, this is an AP view of the shoulder, uh, the humeral head, uh, the coracoid, uh, the, the, the main pieces we look at with the x-ray when we're looking at fractures, the greater tuberosity of the shoulder, which um, the clavicle, um, and this is the basic overview of what you see in a shoulder x-ray. So clavicle, one of the most common fractures we treat in general, um, is a very common injury you're going to see in your practice. Uh, athletes, elderly, um, the anatomy of the clavicle, there's the sternal end um, and the uh, acr uh, chromial end. Um, it's an S-shaped bone. And again, the, the clavicle itself doesn't serve a lot of function in terms of um, motion of the shoulder. It's really an anchor for the bones, that, that, the muscles that attach to the rest of the shoulder and control glenoral humor motion and scapular motion. Um, the chromal end has a trapezius atta attached to it and the deltoid. Uh, the sternal end has the sternocleidomastoid and the pectoralis major. So some really big muscle groups attached to the clavicle, again, cause the forming forces on the clavicle. The, set, the middle clavicle is the typical the, um, area where we see fractures. Um, about 80% of fractures are in the central part of the clavicle. Uh, or mid-shaft, we call it. Um, other functions of the clavicle, it does protect the under uh, underlying neurovascular structures, brachial plexus, sub subclavian veins, and artery, uh, and also protects some of the lung. Uh, again, here's a, di a diagram of, of the neurovascular structures coming underneath the clavicle. So um, rarely do we actually see neurovascular injuries with clavicle fractures, but they can happen with surgery. Um, so they, we have to know where they are and know that they're right underneath the clavicle and they can, they have, and they can be damaged during surgery and people can die from these injuries. So, uh, it's something to be aware of. This, this, this still clavicle again has the CC ligaments. Uh, these essentially suspend the, the scapula. If you, if you imagine, if you can take out these, these ligaments, um, the scap, the scapula essentially isn't attached to the axial skeleton anymore. Um, so these ligaments attach to the clavicle and the scapula, and they sus suspend the scapula in the body. Um, they provide vertical stability. Um, they, there's two components, the trapezoid, which is more lateral, and the conoid, which is the more important, more medial, more important one. 
Uh, there's the AC ligaments, uh, which use can control uh, horizontal displacement of the distal clavicle and the acromion. Uh, there's the capsule around the AC joint. And then again, there's dynamic stabilizers, which have already been discussed before. So this is probably the most important slide for, the uh, for clavicle fractures. Going back to the muscles, so now when the, scap when the uh, clavicle is broken, these muscles attach and they're pulling. So they're deforming the fractures. Um, the sternocleidomastoid pulls the medial segment up. The weight of the arm pulls the lateral segment down. The trapezius can, trapezius can pull the lateral segment up, and the pec uh, muscles can pull the, the shirtle, shoulder or the, the proximal humerus internally, which can deform this, the, the clavicle fracture. The most common mechanism, uh, usually it's a fall directly onto the shoulder. So anterior, superior shoulder uh, impaction, usually fall from height. Uh, you see this a lot in, in sports injuries, especially hockey players. Uh, you can picture the hockey player falling onto the ice or getting checked into the boards. Uh, I probably treated um, seven hockey players with clavicle fracture surgically this, this past season. 7% um, are direct impact to the clavicle. Um, and 6% are fall onto outstretched arm. You see those more in osteoporotic patients, older patients where um, you know, the bone is just weak and a fall onto uh, outstretched arm doesn't break the wrist or the shoulder, it can break the clavicle as well. So this is a you know, diagram of the mechanism. Uh, this, is, this is more of my, my, my more favorite one. This is Tony Romo, broke his clavicle a couple years back, never really got back to form after that. And this is, I'll, I'll leave this up here for a minute just for your, uh, your Giants fans to enjoy. But. So presentation, um, you, it's painful. You know, most broken bones are painful. Very rarely, if you see a broken bone on an x-ray, that's not painful. Really question if it's acute or not. It can be, but usually, you know, have a really dig into the history and see if there's a pre older injury that, that, you, that they weren't reporting. Um, swelling and bruising, obviously. And can, usually, clavicle is very subcutaneous. Uh, and, and, and in thin people especially, it's often, often you have an obvious deformity, either with a bump like you see or the shoulder it can be, you know, if you examine symmetrically, the, the, the affected side can look shortened. Um, and usually they're supporting the limb with a contralateral arm. Uh, you know, the, the weight of the arm pulls on the fracture and it hurts, so they try to stabilize it with, by supporting their elbow or their other arm. Um, again, we all look for open wounds. Open clavicle fractures um, can happen. Uh, especially in thin people. Uh, this is a young, thin boy. You can see the clavicle, you know, obviously something's going on there is poking out. Um, skin tenting is something that's important. So if you see a patient on the, uh, you know, on the field or in your office who has tented skin, that's important because we don't want that skin to open. You know, we don't, we don't want it to become a you know, compound fracture. So it's something you want to address more acutely with surgery usually. Um, so that's something that you would send to uh, an ER or, or your local orthopedist. Um, neurovascular exam, sensory exam is, is important, uh, motor exam and pulses. Again, this is very, very uncommonly you'll see, even though it's so intimately related with the neurovascular structures underneath, rarely do you see a neurovascular injury with these. Um, you, you can, but with high energy trauma, car accidents, you can see brachoplexopathies, um, you can see um, you know, va vascular injury, so it's something to examine. But usually the typical clavicle fracture on the, the, the hockey player who fell on the ice doesn't have a, a neurovascular injury. Um, other things to look out for, though, C um, especially with higher energy injury injuries, tenderness of the, of the neck, scapular tenderness, chest wall tenderness, um, and upper extremity tenderness, because it can be associated injuries with a, a clavicle fracture. It's one example. Uh, so there's a clavicle fracture also with a scapular fracture, a scapular uh, neck fracture. So um, this is a different animal. Treating this is different than just treating an isolated clavicle fracture. Uh, this is what we call a floating shoulder. So you, there's a clavicle or a, really an AC separation. You can see that the, the whole scapula is lateralized. Um, this is a very high energy in, mechanism of injury. You're not gonna see this in your office. It's gonna be a car accident. Um, and these are, these are life-threatening, these injuries. Not so much because of the, the scapular injury itself, because of the force the body absorbed, gets absorbed by more things than just, just the scapula. And these, they often have chest wall injuries, pneumothoraces. Uh, this is a normal thorax you can see associated with a clavicle fracture. So things, other things to look out for associated with clavicle fractures. X-rays, AP view is standard. Um, the 30 degree cephalic tilt view, um, which I'll demonstrate here, uh, Zanka view uh, can be called. It gets the thoracic rib cage out of the, the image. So on the right side, you can see the clavicle better than on the left because there's no overlap of the scapula and the thoracic rib cage. Um, it, it, and this is a standard view if you're looking for a, a clavicle fracture. I don't routinely order this. If a patient comes to my office with shoulder pain, that's not a view I routinely order. But if I then see a clavicle fracture, I'll order it to help better you know, delineate the fracture pattern and what I'm looking at. Um, 
Stress views, um, you know, the rationale x-rays are static images, right? So they're one image in time. Things change in positioning and with, with, uh, with stress. So they can help demonstrate dynamic instability and help guide treatment, uh, have a patient hold weights in both arms and take an x-ray. Uh, really, honestly, do we use them? Uh, they might be underused. Uh, they can be helpful with lateral fractures especially because they help you assess the, the, uh, the CC ligaments to see if they're intact. Uh, this is an example. So this is a, a static x-ray. This is a lady who came in, fell for a horse. Um, she had about 10 rib, rib fractures on the right side, a pneumothorax, and this right clavicle fracture. This is a static x-ray laying in bed, pretty benign. This is, initial plan for this was non-operative treatment. Um, went on to have her rib, ribs plated um, and got out of bed eventually. And this is the x-ray when she's out of bed with the weight of her arm pulling down. Uh, we'll get into more why this is treated operatively, but this has now become, you know, it's debatable, but this, with, a, with multiple injuries like this, now, this now becomes an operative uh, fracture for me. Um, and so she went for surgery. So again, any, any static x-ray, dynamic, either with weights or just with a patient upright, sitting up, standing up, can help, you know, change your, your, treatment, your treatment plan. Classification, this really goes by the, the site of the clavicle fracture. Uh, again, middle third are the most common, up to 80% of the fractures. Uh, most common age group is 13-year-old males. Uh, group two are the lateral one-third, the chromio end, 21%, uh, and the 47-year-old uh, is the most common. And group three are the medial third, which are really uncommon, but you'll see in the older people with osteoporotic bone. Uh, medial one-third are rarely operated on. I've never operated on one on personally myself, so uh, the, and they're, they're the least common. So the group two, there's a subset of group two fractures, and it's really divided by where they occur relative to the CC ligaments. Um, again, going back to the anatomy, the CC ligaments are important for suspending the scapula in, in space. Um, so if the, the fracture is lateral, we call it a type one. Um, if it's medial, we call it a type two, and there's a subset of type two fractures. Type ones are not operative. Type two, and it's debatable, usually end up with surgery because now the, scap the scapula is not connected to the rest of the axial skeleton um, through the CC ligaments. Uh, and then there's you know, three, fours, and fives. Uh, on the right is a type two scapula fracture, uh, clavicle fracture. Uh, which this, this requires operative treatment for, for various reasons, but one of the risks being there's a higher rate of non-union with these fractures, um, which you know, the, the non-union itself is debatable if that's important because a lot of them are asymptomatic, but we still tend to operate on these more um, than we would for a type 1 fracture. So a non-operative treatment is the mainstay still for clavicle fractures. Um, for non-displaced group 1 fractures, middle third, uh, stable group 2 fractures, which are type 1, two, uh, one 3, and five, uh, 4 and most group three fractures, again. Um, there's no reduction technique to be formed. Um, a sling or a figure eight swath, there's been a lot of studies about you know, slings and swaths and, and braces for clavicle fractures, none of which have been really showed to be beneficial. So my treatment is a sling um, in early range of motion. Uh, again, multiple studies have shown no difference between how you immobilize the, 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 the clavicle or the arm. Uh, at two to four weeks, I begin, begin range of motion. Um, usually, the, the displacement of the clavicle you see on an you know, upright x-ray is, is usually the most displacement you're going to see. Um, on this left x-ray, you can see, the, so this is a clearly the displaced clavicle fracture that went on to heal. So now, you must, you're asking well, them why, if you ask an orthopedic surgeon 30 years ago, clavicles never had surgery. Um, so, but I'm sure in your practice, you see us operating on these a lot more and more. So why does that happen? Um, I find with most questions in life, you can probably go to South Park for, to find the answer. You blame Canada for this, all right? So what happened was, you know, the, one of the benefits of having socialized medicine is they have good registries for looking at outcomes. Um, so that they have a good trauma registry. And then Dr. McKee in Canada looked at, he was seeing his, he saw his patients that he operated on with clavicle fractures, some were doing better than others, and he wanted to know why. That was a retrospective you know, examination of his own personal patients. So he decided to do a prospective study looking at, well, what clavicle fractures should we be, op should we be operating on and why? So again, this clavicle healed, but is that patient better off because that clavicle healed? Um, I think if you look at the literature now, looking at that x-ray, you would say this probably should have surgery for various reasons. The true, true indication for, for clavicle fracture surgery, um, displaced group one fractures, and that, that's the part where it gets kind of vague, Unstable group two fractures of the type two and fours. If there's skin tenting, um, if there's open fractures, if it's a floating shoulder where there's an associated glenoid uh, neck fracture where now the, the lateral end of the clavicle and the glenoid and the whole shoulder itself are separated from the axial skeleton. 
Um, and then they go on to non-unite or, or have a symptomatic malunion. So technique-wise, there's different, te there's open reduction, mainly the mainstay is open reduction and tonification versus intramedular nailing. Um, I do open reduction 100% of the time, uh, but you know, some people do put nails inside the clavicle. So this is that study. Um, the Canadian Orthopedic Trauma Society, uh, non-operative treatment compared with plate fixation for displaced mid-shaft clavicle fractures. So it's a randomized prospective study, well done study. I looked at non-op versus plate fixation for displaced mid-shaft clavicle fractures. And how they defined displaced was there was no cortical contact between the medial and lateral segments. So if you can envision this, this, this picture, this x-ray, um, if you can take out the callus that's formed, you can see that the medial and lateral side would have no cortical contact between them at, at time zero. So with, with open reduction and fixation, associated with lower non-union rates, 3% uh, versus almost 11%. Uh, shorter time to union, which is 16 weeks to 24 week, 28 weeks. They had no symptomatic malunions of the ORAF group, and they had improved functional outcome stores. Um, the functional part is really important, especially in younger patients. Um, they, um, the other part about, you know, the, the time to union part might not seem important, but it can be very important for a young athlete. Um, so when I'm you have the displaced cal clavicle fracture. I still have this conversation with the patient that you can, especially if you're a young athlete, this can heal. It's going to take you know, almost twice the amount of time to heal. And this can be important for, patient, uh, for people trying to get back to sports or normal life, the construction worker, things like that. Uh, so operative treatment in the rally, most clavicles are non-displaced. Um, operative treatment is locally excessive in these patients. This is a patient that sent to me. This, she had, it was a young girl or an 18-year-old athlete very thin, had an anterior clavicle plate placed, and you can see that it failed. So we had to go back and revise this thing. So it's not benign doing this surgery, and up to 25% revision rate, uh, reoperation rate with ORAF of clavicle fractures in some studies. So I'm going to skip through some of these examples. I'm going to, so this is just showing an example of clavicle that healed. Uh, move on to proximal humerus fractures. Um, again, this is showing the muscle attachment to the proximal humerus, which acted as the forming forces of the proximal humerus. This is the parts we talk about. You hear us talk about three-part, four-part proximal humerus fractures. The humeral head is one part, the greater tuberosity, the lesser tuberosity, and the, and the cervical neck, neck or shaft is the fourth part we talk about. Uh, blood supply is important for uh, proximal humerus fractures because if you have a, a fracture through the, the neck of the humerus and the greater, and the head is a detached from the rest of the bone, it can disrupt the blood supply to the humeral head and that can die. That can, that can be, that's called avascular necrosis. Um, so that's an, one, one thing we have to tr think about when we're treating these, because if the head goes on to die, it means that they can have a symptomatic uh, AVN, which needs to uh, lead to surgery at, later on down the road. So anatomy, again, we, we looked at it a little bit. Um, so x-rays, again, just going back, uh, an axillary, some kind of lateral view is important to see that the humor head is located in a socket. Uh, it's hard to get an axillary x-ray, a true axillary x-ray with, with a person with a fracture. So we do this different lateral x-rays, a scapular Y x-ray, a Velpo view. These all can be done with the arm at the side and can show that the, the humeral head is located in the glenoid. Uh, this is a, a good example. So this is a, 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 a scapular Y view. You can see the Y of the scapula and you can see that the humeral head is located in that Y, which means it's located. So x-rays, again, this is an AP view. Um, this is an internal rotation view. And this is the scapular Y view showing that, there's a, that the humeral head is located. Uh, this is the near classification of, of proximal humerus fractures. Again, it really goes by parts, um, and this is can guide our treatment how we how we manage these fractures going forward. Um, far majority of proximal humerus fractures, per literature, don't need to have surgery. Uh, this is a surgery out of out of uh, the UK. It's a surgical versus non-surgical treatment of adults with displaced proximal humerus fractures. It's a very large study. It's the pro it's proper randomized clinical trial. Um, 250 patients, 16 years old. The inclusion criteria were 16 years or older. Uh, the average age was 66 years, uh, majority females, and they did a sling versus RAF versus arthroplasty with two-year follow-up. Uh, at two years, there was no significant difference in reported outcomes between operative versus non-operative treatment. I'm not gonna go into that, but you can just see that over time, these lines converge. These, this talks about function, pain. At, over time, the operative versus non-operative treatment, the lines converge and kind of show that you can leave a lot of these alone without surgery. And this is the, so a five-year follow-up, again, the main findings of the profit study uh, remain unchanged at, two, at five years. So why do we operate on these a lot, or why don't we operate on these a lot? You'll see us treat these often with acute open reduction dental fixation. 
Um, looking back at that study, why are we doing that? Um, there's various reasons. Um, but in your practice, you will see a lot of proximal humerus fractures. There's a high incidence among outpatient treated osteoporotic fractures, and severe imp and the impact they have on their life is very important. They can have long-term disability from proximal humerus fracture with or without surgery. So it's something that you're definitely going to see in your practice, especially as the patient population gets older. So this is a recent case I had. Uh, it's a two-part proximal humerus fracture. Um, I fixed this one. So this is a 50-something-year-old uh, active female. Um, who I operated on. I do think that the recovery is faster and the function in my hands, this, this surgery, especially this very simple surgery, can do better with surgery. That being said, this is a surgery I did in my fellowship. Uh, this is a two-part proximal, uh, proximal humus fracture. Treated it fairly well, I think I could fixation, and 10 days later, 10 days post-op, it failed. Um, so she had a, he had out of a revision. Um, so the, this can happen, and it's very common to have a uh, failure of these, these, these surgeries. So we have to really be careful about what, what patients we operate on for this. That being, so this is a patient I had, uh, he had a fall. He had multiple injuries, um, a very unstable patient. He ended up having this fracture dislocation, which was closed reduced. Um, he wasn't stable ever for surgery to fix this. He eventually stabilized and survived. But this went on to heal like this, and he had fairly good function. Not the best function, and going back to Dr. Black's talk, so looking at this patient, if he did, wasn't doing well, delayed treatment with a, a shoulder arthroplasty d does just as well with acute open reduction notification or acute uh, shoulder replacement for that patient. So the fallback is if he doesn't do well, he can have a reverse uh, total shoulder replacement and the outcomes are about the same. So uh, that's, I know kind of quick through that, but we got through it. Any questions? So for clavicle fractures, if you see a clavicle fracture in your office where on all the views there's cortical contact, that one you can fairly safely say that can be treated non-operatively. If there's displacement at all on any view where you see that there's no, the two bones aren't touching, that's what I would refer to an orthopedic surgeon for because there's a lot that goes into the conversation with treating that. Um, we, they can be treated non-operatively, but um, a lot of the studies do show that they, there is a potential that they can do better with surgery. I'm not saying we operate in every 100% of those patients who have no cortical contact, but we do have to just have a thorough discussion about risks and benefits of both non-operative versus non-operative treatment. If it's a 40-year-old construction guy who I can say can get back to work you know, a month and a half earlier with surgery, he might elect for that. Um, if it's an athlete, he might elect to get back to sports faster. Um, again, there's not, and these surgeries aren't benign though, so there has to be a discussion with the risks of surgery as well. So that's why if they're, if they're truly displaced, I would refer to a orthopedic surgeon for management at that point. Uh, proximal humerus fractures, much, a lot of the same younger patients are different than the older patient population. Um, again, uh, I'm, my own practice personally is going more towards non-operative treatment of especially elderly osteoporotic prox proximal humerus fractures. They tend to do pretty well. Um, and with surgery, they don't really do any better. So they don't always have great outcomes, and the salvage for uh, a symptomatic non-union or malunion of a proximal humerus fracture is a reverse total shoulder, and that delayed total shoulder does just as well as if you do on day one. So that's why I tend not to operate on a lot of these anymore acutely. For clavicle fractures, you're saying? I'm sorry, I missed. Sure. If you should have surgery. 
So if you're, if you're going by the, the, mo the best literature we have, evidence-based medicine, that non-displaced or, or dis clavicle fractures that aren't 100% displaced, they can be treated non-operatively with, with similar functional outcomes. It does take longer to heal, and, but that, with surgery, you're at, you're at the risk of surgery, obviously. So that, some of it does come down to patient preference. Um, and if you're comfortable having that conversation with patients regarding the, the surgical options and the potential risks or benefits, that's a discussion you can have with patients. Um, the, I mean, the question is if you're comfortable having that conversation regarding the surgical treatment. Um, you know, for displaced clavicle fractures, and this is even my own, my own hands, I, if, if I saw a displaced clavicle fracture, it's not 100% operative. A lot of it depends on what the, clavicle, the patient wants and their goals, and also the pattern of fracture, and there's different things that go into my thought process with treating those. Um, so I can't really give a good answer, you know, because not every patient with a displaced clavicle fracture, I would say, needs surgery, but there's a lot of more, you know, things that go into that um, than to just saying yes or no if it's displaced or not. Um, you know, some of it's preference, some of it's how displaced the fracture is, um, so if there's no cortical contact, if, if medial side and lateral side are like this and it's touching, that's okay. If it's displaced, you know, where there's no cortical contact, that's what this, at least the McKee study out of Canada shows that they can have worse functional outcomes, longer time to healing, as well as higher rates of not healing. Um, so that's, that's what the literature shows. Now, if that conversation can be had in your office, um, you can have that conversation. Um, the problem is that Talking about the surgical part of it is, is really on our end what we have to explain to the patient, what goes into the surgery, what are the risks of, of having the surgery. Um, so that's the part that is gonna be hard for you guys to have that conversation in the office about. So. Yep. In a young patient especially, so this x-ray that you see here, this is a younger patient, um, where is it? this one. So th this has a high rate of, of, of avascular necrosis because there's a complete displacement of the, the shaft and the head part. Um, and this is also a younger patient. The AVN part of it, we really can't solve it. With, with the surgery, it doesn't, I have to look in the literature on this, but it doesn't really change how the, the, the rate of AVN with or without surgery. All right, so, um, so that's not really a good indication for me to, for surgery because I'm worried about the head dying. If the head's gonna die, it's usually gonna happen because the injury occurred, caused the vascular injury, and that's, that's not gonna be changing with me putting the bone back to where it needs to be. That vascular injury doesn't repair itself like that. Um, if the head goes on to die, with, you know, and fixing that, if you have AVN, fixing that is harder if you had done, already done a surgery to try, you know, with the, there's plates and screws in there with scar tissue, that's a harder fix than if you hadn't fixed it in the first place. So there's, you know, it's not always an indication to fix it to prevent AVN because it really doesn't prevent AVN itself. The injury causes that to occur. Um, but for this patient, th this does have a high rate of AVN, but we can't leave this like this. This, this won't do well, this fracture here. Um, but you can see that even with fixing it, with fairly good fixation, they can fail and they can, get, they can have problems, so. Yep. Thanks. Thanks.